Okay, social wellness. We have one of my favorite guests of my entire life. Um, outside of my husband, she's probably the closest to me, one of my best friends and colleagues. Uh, the lymph goddess, who I'm so excited for you all have to have an opportunity to meet, Desiree Despong, who has been a lymphologist for many years in New Zealand, and she's coming from you from New Zealand. Uh, so you're watching a live Zoom today because of the time zone and the different things we had going on. This was the best way. See? The sun agreed. Wow. You just, that was <laughs> intense. I mean, we just arranged the whole video so the sun wasn't going to... That's funny. Um, <laughs> About the lymph goddess see what happens the whole world shines on you because Desiree's taught me everything that I know in all honesty um, about how to manage the lymph I knew the lymph was important prior to Desiree I just couldn't find a good way to really solve the problem of the lymph that was effective and efficient and we've known each other for eight nine mm -hmm. almost Long a decade time. yeah almost a decade and um, it's not so fun when your friend who you want to talk to 14 times a day lives 16 hours away, but we make it happen. And through the events of what the world is going through, we sat down and she's a very giving person. And what we are presenting today for you is truly not just a gift of hers, but it's really a gift of hers from her entire life's work that she's giving out to so many clients practitioners, everybody, for your top uh, lymphatic health, how to help your lymphatic health. And this is something you'd normally have to go to a workshop for, a weekend workshop, a two to four day workshop. And she's decided that given what's going on, we really need to help people's health. And the best way to help their health is through the lymphatic. So while I introduce Desiree, I'm going to go change my curtain a little bit so that the uh, sun doesn't glare in. Desiree, take over, explain to them how you got to where you did with the lymphatics, if you would. And Thank you, Kelly. Uh, kia ora, everyone from New Zealand. Um, it's certainly a, an honor to be on this with Kelly as well. She's, uh, we've become very close friends over the years, so I'm excited to be actually doing this. Normally this requires me a 27 hour flight and layover to be with her, so I get to do this in my own backyard for a change, which is exciting. So uh, I have had a number of years in the health field, um, but specifically in the lymphatics, probably in the last 15 years, uh, more focused on understanding it from many levels, not just what we are medically told, but what you actually see in clinic is quite different. And I think that's one of the reasons that drive me to start to teach more on it. You know, with this whole experience that we're all going through right now, it's, um, forcing us to really look within and see what we can do for our own immunity. And I think I've seen a phenomenal increase in uh, expertise coming out in the immune system and educating everyone. Um, the interesting thing I don't see is a lot around the lymphatic system, yet the two are the same as we know, right? Right. So, so we go. Go ahead. No, so um, it's exciting to be able to be here and help others. You know, it's... Um, it's a big drive to to support everyone what they you know with what they're doing right now and self care is probably the most important thing we can be doing so for us to be able to offer something it's kind of exciting to you know be able to do that first and foremost um, but secondly educate let's get that lymphatic system understood a bit more out there I think it's um it's no, to, that end, to that end that's a great point you know I just uh, recently went through massage school to get a license, blah, blah, blah. And there was four pages devoted to lymph, 28 pages to the cardiovascular system, 27 pages to the endocrine system, 20 pages or more to every other system except for the lymphatics. And if any discipline about the lymphatics, I would have thought it was the massage therapy or the physical therapist. Doctors are not taught about the immune system. Medical no, um, Stanley Roxon was at a conference that I attended, a lymphology conference, and he had actually done a study on the doctorates um, throughout the US. And I think on average, it was like two or three hours on the lymphatic system. And was we're given. Gonna tell everybody who Stanley is, because not everybody knows. Stanley is a, an amazing lymphologist at um, Stanley, uh, Stanford University, and he does a lot of study around lymphatics. So he was um, 
part of this conference and he just happened to say he had looked around the world but predominantly in the United States on how much study doctors did and and you see it all the time there is a, um, a sadly a, a lack of understanding I think they have a good of the immunity but not so much of the lymphatics and it's kind of the same right and they, how can they? How can they have a grasp on the immunity? I mean, with everything that's going on right now, you and I sit back and go, okay, it's time for people to manage their lymph and those that have managed their lymph are handling this well because their terrain is okay. And there's been some conversation, not in mainstream, but in some of the offshoots where people are talking about the difference between germ versus terrain. So let's talk mm -hmm. about terrain. What is the terrain? The terrain is, well, I mean, really. It's the space yeah. in the cells. That's where the lymph is. Yeah. So, you know, we look at the lymphatics like a sewage system, really. It's collecting and removing the byproduct. And if you don't do that, you know, it is going to back up. Your immunity is going to be reduced. Um, so it makes sense to get the lymph moving. And, you know, this lockdown, I mean, we're three or four weeks in New Zealand right now. And, and a lot of people are sitting around. They're not moving. And it's a big issue. You know, people, um, you know, are really struggling with that lack of um, having something outside of them and their community to do as opposed to work inside. Whereas I see this as a phenomenal opportunity for everyone to look at themselves again and decide what's, what really means something to me. And we're going to talk a little bit about emotional um, detoxing as well from a lymphatic point of view a bit further on in this but um, it's you know it's all part of it and we get to make a choice really now we've had four weeks for well, you guys are four weeks right yeah four weeks and March 13th is when we got shut down so in regard to movement you know we were talking about lymph right before we started this and I you had written something that I just thought was so eloquent because it's so true lymph is up against so much and it's so little known about well, it's the poor cousin of the circulatory system. It's, you know, it, it, you know, we know everything about vascular. Well, a lot, I should say, but we're still only identifying lymphatics. So look at the glymphatics, you know, the, the lymphatics in the brain. I mean, they've only, that's only two, three years ago. Whereas anyone that worked in the you've field is going. Been. You've been saying it for the entire time that I've known you, that there's lymph in the brain. They've now recently documented in Western medicine that there are, and they've named them gliolymph. Uh, for uh, for the lymphatics in the brain. There's things that I've said for a few years that I think are part of the lymphatic system that we'll talk about down the road. But when you work in this arena, you can't help but understand how it works. So talk about that for a moment. Well, it's just more fascinating for me. I mean, why is it that we thought, I mean, the body is such an intricate, amazing system that at what point would the body shut its whole system down from here? Like, just didn't make sense to me, you know, on a mere logical point of view. Right. So it's, it's, it wasn't surprising. And we always talked about brain uh, draining the brain because we would find that the fogginess would change in people when we actually drained all through the cervical nodes. So, you know, for me, it wasn't rocket science. It was just like, yay, we have proof now. And I think we're going to see that, um, you know, there's more diversity in the research going on out there in lymphatics at the moment. You know, we're defining, you know, how the parasympathetic, so that, you know, rest and digest to repair a situation of our body, our autonomic nervous system is playing a part. But, you know, it's going to be fascinating in five years' time whether that's contradicted too, because a bit like the Starling principle, right? That's our vascular physiology. That only changed not that long ago, too, where they realized that 85% of your fluid in your body went via the lymphatics. So, so again, for those that aren't scientific, that are layman, let's just, so the Western community thought that 80% of the toxic load went through the venal system, through the veins, through the yes. cardiovascular, the venal system. About 10, 10 years ago? Now it's got to be longer. Yeah. It is. It's about, I think it's 2004 it was done, and they found that actually 85% of our tissue fluid is going back via lymphatics. So, you know, it changes. Fluid is responsible just because Desiree's so brilliant. She's a lymphologist. She attacks it very systematically, very organized, and she's been doing it for so long. And I just want to break it down for those that don't know. So, the lymph, mm -hmm. what's in the lymph fluid? This fluid that's around the cells that 
where our toxins, our gases, our nutrients, everything is circulated throughout that lymphatic fluid. If it's fluid, it will flow. Yeah. And so it we dump we, that into the cardiovascular system, right? Yes. Yeah. So once the fluid from the tissue goes into the lymphatic vessels or capillaries, you call them, we call them capillaries in New Zealand, just to give you a bit of New Zealand lingo. Yeah. Uh, so once it goes in, that's when we call it lymph fluid. But, um, you know, the byproduct within that lymph fluid can be phenomenal if you are unwell and you've got inflammation and you're, you know, you've got viruses, bacteria, cancer cells, you know, there's a lot, there's proteins, there's all sorts of, it's quite a, you know, a blend and of interest. And inflammation from improper foods, from fat, long fats. Uh, yes emotional stagnancies from stress. Oh yeah, that's a biggie. Stress. And they're proving it now in research. Yeah, and that's our concern is that people are home, they're more sedentary, they're more stressed, and their drainage, which already was compromised between Desiree and I, that's our philosophy, now it's even more compromised. Mm-hmm. So we need to get around moving again and get them learning how they can take care of self, which is, you know, the whole reason, you know, we arranged to get out your manual techniques of uh, lymphatic drainage that you've organized on your website, right? We're going to talk about that at the end, just in case you missed out on that. And now we're offering this just to give you some ideas of what people can do to get moving. And it doesn't have to be rocket science. It's not big it's just some small changes in your life that could be quite phenomenal it's knowledge you know not knowing i think that's the biggest thing when i learned about the lymph it was like well how do you ever not work within the lymphatics once you know about it like for iron it was like once you knew that 80 percent of the physical body the illnesses rather in the physical body are emotionally laden he was like well let me just focus on the emotional body that seems the easiest if that's 80 percent of the body let's just go there and I was like, oh, well, if 80% of the toxins are drained out through the lymph, let's just focus on the lymph and let all the rest of the body take care of the rest. Well, I'm going to remind all your clients of a funny story. When I first met Kelly and she was sitting in the back of the class and I think I was only an hour in and I think you stood up at that point and went, oh my God, this is amazing. It makes sense. It was like, it was so funny. I'll never forget that. <laughs> Literally up and said I've learned more in this last hour than I've learned in the last two years taking other people's classes and there were people that you had trained but this goes to what I've always said is go to hundred percent of the information because play whispered on the way lane which is why I'm so excited honestly for this new platform that everybody's learning master classes and learning how to use zoom and Facebook live to get the information to hundred percent of the information so there's no this there's no um, jumbling up of the information when I heard you teach a class, I literally felt like I should go back and get my next, my last two years of classes money back because I'd been doing lymph while we had gotten some good results in those couple of years. I never really did any of the manual pumping and all of my clients out there know those first two years that we had LET technology, I didn't use manual pumping because I didn't understand it. I sat in your class for one hour and was like, holy crap, we've been doing this wrong. We need to manually pump. And that started me understanding the fascia and started our real... Jenny of interest. <laughs> Teaching this class to me all weekend, I guess I'm getting what I want out of it. So, some of your, my favorite videos. Let's, uh, we have here the 10 tips to lymphatic health. Maybe we should use some of that as we go through here. Oh my God, that's adorable. So firstly, we'll, um, just to let everyone know, we are making this available on Kelly's site. So we'll talk more about that at the end. But, you know, this system is phenomenal where we've got all these lymph nodes, we've got all these lymphatic vessels. But you know what? One of the hardest things for this system is that it has no heart, like no pump, like the heart. So it's relying on you to be moving or breathing sufficiently to be able to get that propelling fluid moving through the vessel. So if we look down in the corner here, we've got a, you know, an animation of the actual lymphatic vessel and we'll see those little flaps and they're called mitral valves and they work a little bit like, um, you know, a dam, the, the um, gates of the dam as it fills up, it opens and the fluid pushes through. And in between each of those is what they call a lymphangion, which is 
a muscle that's a little bit like squeezing the towel, like when you go, it moves like this. So it all relies on movement and the way our autonomic nervous system's working to actually get you moving it. And at the end result, what we're trying to do is get rid of the pathogen, so the cellular waste, the byproduct that's in the tissue, right? And so this system is sort of, as I say, I, I relate it like the poor cousin of the cardiovascular. It's kind of sad, really, because it's, you know, this is your immune system, if, you know, we want to call it a system. So, you know, we're just going to move through a couple of these things. So I relate the vessels a little bit like a stream or a river. And, you know, as young children, if we were around a stream, we always, you know, love to put the rocks down and block it up and create a dam. And that's pretty much what happens in the tissue if we aren't moving our fluid. As we've said, it's 85% of that tissue fluids going via lymphatics. So when we lay in bed at night, our tissue fills back up and we got to get up in the morning, we got to move. That's often when we get up in the morning, we crack, we pop, we start to move. You feel a little stiff. And as you start to move, things start to start to feel a little more flowy, if you will. So we need to move to make our lymph move. Yeah, speaking of which, they say the research says that if we lie on our left side, we actually get a better drainage from the brain side of things. And um, also, most people will notice their swelling goes down at night when the parasympathetic, so again, the rest repair, when we go into that sleep and we're repairing, that's why our fluid goes down at night as well, because of that particular system playing an active role. So it's not, um, it's actually quite a reality of doing that. So if you want to drain your brain, try and encourage yourself to lie on the left side as opposed to your right, you know, Kelly, right, left. <laughs> it's a little joke with us. All right, so lymph nodes. So we've got over 600 to 1,000 throughout the body, and I can guarantee that every one of you would be different. Um, to actually test it is quite an involved process and I don't think anyone can really count them. So we're kind of guessing here um, how many, but oh, ironically, half of those are in your abdomen. So that's why the gut is so important to your health um, because you know 70% of your immune system's there. So we wanna be able to have that gut health working um, so your immunity is strong. I mean, so we have a selection of them. The main clusters we talk about are your cervical. So they're in around your neck. So Kelly's taught you some manual pumping in your neck. We have axilla, which is the arm puff. I mean, arm pit, sorry, which we've talked about the arm puff. No puff, <laughs> only pit. So hopefully you can understand my accent. <laughs> oh, we could all listen to you all day. They all know that. Um, <laughs> our organs associated with the lymph system as well. What we're talking about right now is the vessels and the nodes, which are completely contained themselves, their own circulatory, if you will, system, which connection of from head to toe. Yes. Uh, there, there are a lot of concentrated here in our neck and a yes. lot, about 20% or so in our neck, a good 60% in our gut and the rest of the 20% or throughout the body, mostly concentrated around all of our joints, all of our bendy areas. Yeah, and there is like, we call like pearl necklaces around each organ as well. So there's actually a cluster of lymph, um, lymph nodes around the organs. So, and they're, you know, they're buried in the mesenteric. So that's in the small intestine there. So they're all over the place. And, and, you know, most people talk about their glands being up and that's a good indicator of the lymph nodes are swollen. And we talk about that with the sore throat, et cetera. The, the glands being up in American speak instead of oh. means that you're a little swollen in the neck yeah. or in the groin. Some people notice that or in the armpits that they're a little swollen in their lymph nodes. Okay, cool. Thanks for the deciphering. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so these lymph nodes are like the powerhouse. They're where we've got all our immune cells going on in there. And they're kind of like, I relate them to a little bit like the transfer station. You know, when the rubbish comes in and they decide to what they recycle and they get rid of. But this is where you've got this cluster of lymphocytes. So they're the ones that are giving us our antigens, so you know, giving us the the recovery and the repair. So it's really about destroying whatever that's in that fluid that isn't good for the body. So that's where you're gonna get the hub. And that's why they swell. They, they're getting busy, they're working. Like they've got a team in there trying to manage the byproduct that's coming through. But at the end of the day, they're the powerhouse of our immunity. So, you know, we wanna keep them moving. And that's why this 
manual technique is about pumping them to actually be able to move fluid through more effectively and actually clean up the environment. So if we look at this purple shell we're looking at is a node, right? Correct, yes. The hand are the pathogens, which are bacteria, viruses, whatever, okay? So what happens is the body's translate is moving these little pathogens throughout the body. They get to the point of the node, and the lymphocyte is the white blood cell. That's what layman's know. That's your white blood cells. That's your fighters, right? So your white blood cells determine at the level of the node in there, and all those little, I call them like little rooms. Each one's like a little department. Mm -hmm. And each one of those little rooms identifies the pathogen and goes, oh, this isn't our pathogen. Go to the next room. And if it's the next room's pathogen, and it goes, oh, you're, you're like an allergen, so we need to send out a basophil, to type of white blood cell. And so it creates basophils to fight the allergen toxin. If it's viral, it'll send more of an eosinophil. If it's more bacterial, it'll send more of an eos. So it depends on the type of pathogen at the level of the node decides what type of white blood cell to create, and then it stimulates the white blood cell growth to happen and that's why you get the swelling because it's the activity of the white blood cells being created because it's identifying what the pathogen is so how is this a bad thing how has this been conceived in western medicine as this reaction is bad this reaction is the reaction we're looking for this is how we know we're our body's fighting something i know when silas comes home from school if he well when he went to school when when he had lymph nodes that a bunch of kids at school had stuff so we did stuff at home to boost his immune system vitamin d oils increasing his sleep increasing giving him more fermented foods that things we can talk about to enhance his own immunity but this is a key point because i think most people even western medicine docs to be honest with you don't understand how the immune system works and where the pathogens are identified at the level of the node and if that node is not accessible because it's stuck, it's stagnant, it's deep in there, there's all this congestion around it, you've got an inactive immune system. Exactly. And then let's say a pathogen comes in like, oh, I don't know, COVID-19, and then it hyperreacts, creates a cytokine storm because it's trying to fight so hard and it's like bringing paddles to a system. It over-responds to a non-working that's how a non-working, non-regulatory immune system doesn't work well because it over-responds. A good working immune system goes, oh, here's some pathogens, here's some swelling, create fluid and mucus to move it out. Okay, sorry. I just, that is so key. I think that's so key for people to understand. Exactly. No, well said. All righty. So let's just look at the system. Oh, it's going to give me a, a little... Y'all get ready, this is my, one of my two top favorite videos. So this is a good um, video showing you where the lymphatic system sits. So it literally is under the skin, about 75% of it is surface lymphatic vessels. And they start as this blind ended capillary. So you can see all the little fibers attaching, pulling it open, and it's designed to pull in the fluid that's sitting in the tissue. It moves down what they call to a pre-collector. So it's, you know, a bit like the pipeline at the sewage system. It's starting to get larger and it's starting to get some more propulsion. So you can see the mitral valves, those joins. That's where it's, you know, opening up the dam, pushing the fluid through. And then it comes into the collector, which is kind of the main hub site. And you're going to go through at least one lymph node before you return it back to the heart. Um, normally there's a lot more than one, but at least one. And so you can see all those other vessels coming in. So, you know, this is the main pipeline. So that gives you a really good visual to see where it's sitting. So it is just in under the skin. And that's why it's easy to stimulate from a dry skin brushing point of view or from massage and that we can actually get it moving. That's a great video. That in front of the Pampas and Marilee was like, only a mom wants to see that twice. I literally want to watch it like five times. I just love that. Called me a limp mom. Anyway, go ahead. So let's just do a quick overview and let's move on to what we can do. Okay, so we right. learned that it's, you know, returning the tissue fluid, you know, 85% of it. It's, you know, moving out those toxins or the cellular waste in the environment. 
but it's also regulating the fluid volume and pressure. So what that means is swelling is a good indicator that your lymphatics isn't working correctly, right? So it's designed to regulate the amount of fluid that's in the tissue. And if it's not, then of course, swelling, inflammation, and all those other things are gonna occur. Muscle movement and breathing. This is imperative if we want to move it. If we're sitting around, we call it couch potatoes in New Zealand. Does that common yeah. analogy? Yeah. yeah. So if you're sitting around doing nothing, you ain't moving. <laughs> but the lymph nodes, as we've learned, really important to our immune health. Okay, they're the powerhouse of where we've got all those lymphocytes, so all those little white blood cells, as you said, and um, we really want them doing their job effectively. So, you know, just as an overview, if you're looking at it, you know, the lymphatic system is vital. It isn't the poor cousin. It's a vital part of the circulatory system, and it really is your waste elimination and your primary immune defense. So we can now understand why we want to get it activating and working effectively if we want to be well and, you know, as you always say, maintain our regulation or our environment is strong to be able to manage something like this virus that we're dealing with right now. So let's look at some of the things we can do. So one of the first things we're going to talk about is just what is lymphatic congestion look like? Like what would be a presentation just to give me an idea? Do I have it? Am I, am I dealing with a lymphatic issue? And some of the, obviously the primary one is, you know, edema swelling, you know, um, and including the pre and post surgery swelling. I think there's a Personally, I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding how long swelling should be there. You know, like um, if you read a lot of the literature coming out now from a physio perspective, they talk about the first seven days ice packs, but then they're talking about warmth and they're talking about trying to get that swelling down because if it's there for too long, it starts to damage the environment. So we really want to be able to get that swelling out to create obviously circulation, we want more nutrients, we want the inflammation gone and the byproduct and the, you know, the dead cells, et cetera. So the recovery's sped up. Lymphedema. So, just like to say, I wish Dr. Carasol was on this right now because I'll tell you what, he and I've noticed a huge difference in his cavitational surgeries where people would swell for three or four or five days afterward. But if they come to the center and they do lymph first, Hardly any swelling at all, like a couple hours, and that's it. For oh, you've opened up the sites. Surgery. And he's been going so far as to inject their tonsils as well to get this improvement, but he's blown away at how quickly patient moves when the lymphatics are already moving well before surgery. So, yeah. And you don't have to have edema to have congested lymph, just to clarify, but she's going to. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so lymphedema is a condition, um, we often hear more of the secondary lymphedema, which is when lymph nodes are removed, but there is a primary that can happen at certain times of your life where you have a lymphatic system that's function is inhibited, so it just doesn't work as well, doesn't drain as well, and on presentation it's like they've got little tiny lymph nodes as opposed to what we would have in, in a normal presentation. So. Um, fibr like breast pain, uh, fibrocystic breasts, um, sorry, hopefully I say that correctly, I'm always, <laughs> um, you know, like it's, an, it's, a, it's blocked up plumbing, it's, you know, we, we live in an environment where we think it's okay to have these conditions and we've been told to live with it, well, we certainly are here in New Zealand, it's like just part of being a woman, but no, it's not, it's about, you know, you want to get those the drainage and the breast tissue going and the chest for men as well. So well, we can keep a, lot a healthy. Of, sorry. A lot of our women are told they have um, dense breasts. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about, fibrocystic breasts, but this is just natural. They just come back in for your mammogram because you have dense breasts. You have to do it more often. No, dense breasts is a sign that your body's holding on a toxic load. Well, I'll be honest, it was, it was the breakthrough for me. I was one of those women that, you know, two of the four weeks of my cycle, I had breast pain. It was phenomenal. You know, it was take off the bra, hold the boobs for a while and ow. And then I got into this and my first session, I think I had two sessions and all of a sudden it was like, what, you're kidding me? Like, 
they're soft, they've got, you know, yeah, sure, they, I lost a little bit of volume, but hey, you know, they feel good. And ever since, so, you know, it's, it's something we just don't know. And some of my cases I've had come through the clinic, you know, like you, you couldn't even touch them to start with. And then they're looking at getting, you know, bilateral mastectomies. So that's like removal of both their breasts to deal with the pain. And we get the fluid moving and we get the lymphatics up taking the fluid more effectively and wham, they've got, you know, they're walking around spending all their money on clothes as instead of a surgery now, so it's great. <laughs> I had a young woman come in that's, I think she's 17, she's 17. And her breasts, she has a chronic diagnosis of CRPS. Her breasts were so full up here, up here, like almost like mastitis feeling. Like when I touched them, she's like, oh, please, they're so sore. And I was like, I mean, it literally felt like her breasts were ready to explode. And then three to four sessions, I mean, this girl lost like 15 pounds in, not even two months with us and i saw the before and after picture which i didn't take somebody else took the dentist actually and we couldn't believe the fluid loss here just the amount of fluid that she was holding which was toxic load as we moved her her lymph she looked like she had gained all this weight when in reality it was just toxic fluid mm. yeah it's amazing i know we so, gotta you get know, it, but it's really exciting information we're giving them and i think it's waking a lot of people up they didn't know that that wasn't normal to not have sore breasts. Mm -hmm. That's story. So autoimmune, um, obviously, you know, if the lymphatics is part of the immunity, I, I use it a little bit like a computer, you know, we defrag a computer and then the computer functions more efficiently. Um, but you know, the same thing with lymphatics, if you've got your environment, with lots of cellular waste, the lymphatic system is struggling, the immune system will be struggling too you know, then we're going to have an issue with autoimmune because of course the body's not going to know how to re regulate, right? Mm -hmm. So, and digestive complaints. Well, we talked earlier about 70% of the immune systems there and over half your lymph nodes. So again, you know, digestive complaints are going to be an indicator, you know, and obviously our swollen nodes and glands, we talked about that and any inflammation, if it's not clearing up is going to again be a good example of an issue with lymphatics. So, but if we move forward, what can we do? All right, so probably the major one I love the most is breathing. And yeah, I know we're all breathing because you know we wouldn't be alive right now if we weren't, but it's quality of the breath that we're doing that is probably one of the biggest issues I see. And when we're dealing with diaphragmatic breathing, we can propel up to 15 times more fluid from basically the, uh, the, the lower chest. Yeah, the diaphragm, which is sort of an under this area here. So that's a group of muscles that sort of come in and they move out and go back in when we're breathing. And that's where our cisterna chile is, which you've talked about, or cisterna piquet, depending on what you study. And that's like a reservoir that has deep intestinal lymph nodes. They're on a kind of a diagonal down into our iliac. Oh, and then that area right here. Into there, and then the idea of that diaphragmatic breathing is it actually propels the fluid up to our left subclavian, so back to the heart. And so it's coming up through what they call the thoracic duct. So our breathing is imperative, especially just think of it this way 20 years ago, how many people sat in a desk in front of a computer? So we have all these men and women, and we're wondering why there's a, an increase in say prostate issues, there's an increase in women's fertility and their health of well-being when it comes to their cycles. Could it be that we're just building up fluid in that environment because we're not moving it, we're not up and about, we're not active anymore to the degree that we were 20, 30 years ago. This could be part of the problem. And of course, when we're at work, you know, when you sit in front of a computer like we are right now, we often hunch our shoulders, you know, so again, we're, you know, if you lift your shoulders up and try to take a big breath in, go on everyone, take a breath in and with your shoulders up, you don't get much breath, right? If you drop your shoulders, take a breath, you can get it right up into the chest. So diaphragmatic is all about, and, and I know you've done videos on your site, right? To teach people how to breathe properly. So go back to True Wellness, have a look at their Facebook lives, see what they've done. One thing I do want to add, though, if, if there's some 
upper chest issues going on, it's really important we do the abdominal breath, but bring it up into the chest as well, so that we're basically opening up. Remember that old, I must, I must increase my breast, you know? It's one of the ones that even, like Neil Piller is our lymphologist guru down here in Australasia, and it's one of the ones he teaches his lymphatic compromised uh, patients to do, because when we open our chest up, we can actually bring more breath in. And when we close down, we kind of hunch over that diaphragm and actually sort of is going to propel fluid. So it's a really good one, but it's just realizing even every day, where are my shoulders? Are they up here or they're here? Am I breathing deeply? And it's, you know, it's one of the things we see in heart rate variability, right? Like you can monitor how well someone breathes. And I would say I probably get one in about 40 that actually can. And it's quite phenomenal. So that's one I really want to push and it's free and it's good for you and it extends your life. So why wouldn't you do it? And this is conscious breathing. This is taking 10 deep conscious breaths, the 10 penny rule. The, one, the way this woman is standing on this video is something I share with a lot of my clients because, you know, you talked a lot about, you know, we get this posture. The best way to reverse that is grab your hands and pull them behind your body. When you stand like this, it's instantly drops your shoulders and opens your chest. So exactly. You're not breathing by just putting your hands behind you and it allows you to open your chest and drop your shoulders and then take 10 deep breaths. You're not too much more conscious of, to it than that. Great. Really good. And they can do that all at home for free. And exactly. And obviously we've talked about this other one, get moving, right? Got to get that muscle movement to get the lymphatics, the vessels to move. Remember, there's no pump. So if we're not moving, lymphatics isn't moving. And this can be done. You don't have to necessarily hit the gym. You know, we can be out walking, we can be doing yoga. Yoga's, there's some phenomenal lymphatic poses for yoga, right? And they, they've even done research with lymphedema in Australia where they found there was a significant reduction in swelling with yoga. So, you know, it's a great one. You know, there's the lymphasizer, for example, or the rebounder. You know, that's fantastic. Just be mindful, though, that it's designed to actually, the technique's designed to create um, this, you know, gravitational pull. So it's pump-like. So our feet usually stay on the mat we don't jump like a trampoline so it's kind of yeah. a movement like this or a pulse yeah 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 bouncing so, is what was that sorry bouncing instead of jumping yes yeah so there is a and, and there is um there is a difference sometimes between a rebounder and a lymphasizer because the lymphasizer was designed differently with a certain spring system to create that resistance so you know, they're not all alike, just so that people understand. And especially if you've got a sore back or something, you want the correct one. But there's the, you know, there's the, the um, vibrational pads now. And there's, you know, there's lots of, there's the chi machine that you can lie down if you just want to take a chill pill and have the vibration done for you. And so there's lots of choices out there if you want to purchase something. Yep. So the other one is water. I want to get to the... You know, they want to have the best of the best, your flow prezzo, that's a whole nother story. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, well that's yeah, that is yeah. <laughs> different um, story. What was it, sorry? It's a different story. It is, it is. Uh, so water. Okay, so I use the analogy again, the river. You know, if it's flowing, you have this beautiful clear water. If it's backing up, you don't, right? It has the debris, it has the byproduct. The same thing is with water. We do need, and it's good quality water. It's not necessarily out of the tap that most people think will be okay. It's you know, often filled with so many chemicals. So, you know, again, going back to the fact that if we're talking about moving waste, you know, we think about if you flush the toilet, you flush the toilet with water, don't you? So the same analogy applies with the body. So there's always the argument of how much is enough, right? So what's, what's your recommendation in the United States? Because it differs throughout the world. So we say half your body weight in ounces if you're standing still. Like if you're not doing any activity, half your body weight in ounces. Good. All righty. So 
dry skin brushing, you have already done some information on that and it's a fantastic stimulator. Obviously it's always done before a shower. Um, it's done on dry skin and you usually make sure you've got the right brush though. For my elderly and that, I get them to get an old, uh, do you call them face cloths? Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's usually old enough to create a little bit of like stimulation because it's kind of a little bit rough. And again, it's you don't have to buy something. You can use something like that, but trying to get that stimulation, you've talked about which way to do it. So we, we talk in our world proximal to distal, but you use the great analogy of the, the toll booth right and the cars here and move those cars first. And so that's fantastic from that point of view, if you understand. And, and the direction to keep it simple is towards the heart because this will come down and the rest will come up. And if you use that analogy, you're always coming into the environment where the major lymph nodes are, if you kind of stick to that. And if you don't know what she's talking about, we did a Facebook Live a couple weeks ago on it. I did one on Dr. Mindy Peltz's website. I did one on Dr. Christine Schaffner's Facebook Live. Both podcasts are coming out soon. Um, it's on our Facebook Live. And we gave, again, another gift from Desiree, um, a gift of how to manually stimulate your lymph. And that's available on NotMed's website, which we'll talk about here um, now and at the very end. But if you go to notmeds.com, it's a new website. It's um, in addition to the True Wellness website, but it's highlighting more about the Flow Prezo and about it's on the Soul and about the lymphatics and it's about the podcast and bringing all the great intelligent minds and hearts that I know, bringing them to you in an interview, much like we're doing now. This is if given what's going on. This not meds has been on the platform for two years. It's just now launching, happens so to be. Um, however that gift was again from Desiree and that's a worksheet that's available. If you subscribe to our podcast, then you'll be able to receive that via email as a free gift. These, this tonight is just a free gift for everybody on Facebook. We ask you to share it with your friends, share it with your practitioner, share it with your doctor, share it with everybody so that everybody knows how to manage their lymph. And uh, if they have more questions, they can always come back to the lymph goddess, Desiree, the <laughs> lymph queen here in uh, Pennsylvania. I love it. But, All right. Uh, dry brushing. I often have people use the little bump if they're a little more sensitive to start with. Because I also can find that people think, oh, I need to like rub my skin so raw it's red. Less is more. Hear Kelly Kennedy say that. Less is more. Softer and gentler is better. I and, you, and it should feel like a tingle, like, and, but no red raw experience. That's, that's like going over the top. Uh, goosebumps, erect your pillow, like you're creating little tiny goosebumps on the skin. Okay. So one of the things that um, we're trained in in lymphology is to avoid certain fats. So they're what we call long chain fatty acids. So they're the ones, um, so basically our, we'll go back to our digestion again. Inside there, there's all these like finger-like projections called villi, and they're actually responsible for removing the fats and proteins in the body. Now we're not talking necessarily just meat here. So it's about reducing often the type of certain fats. And we're not, you know, it's not rocket science. It's in every diet now that we avoid the fatty meats, the fatty foods, the kind of things like that. Coconut oil is considered a medium chain fatty acid. So in lymphology, it's one of the ones that we would recommend. But you want to be thinking about what is it you're eating. I mean, we are what we eat, right? So it's a, just another thing to, instead of overloading the system, just reduce the quantity of those certain types of fats. Oh, uh, we so we're going to fats for an entire thing. So we're just going to leave it at that. If you want more information about fats, myself, Dr. Pampa, we, we've done a lot of information out there about good fats versus bad fats, skinny fat. Eat more fats, good fats. Is exactly. Most of our clients don't eat enough fats when, when they hear how much oil, butter, and cream and things they use, good quality, they're freaking out. And nuts and nut butters, and I, I, I should be dripping with oil. Yeah, it, I think it's, you know, this, this whole thing that we've gone and avoided, you know, the fats and oils is a worry, but it's only certain types. It's like, we're going to talk about salt soon too, another one that's been, there's been so much incorrect information put out there so it gets so confusing for everyone so you know we're trying to keep it simple but 
um, it's so important to the lymphatic function and just like increasing certain oils, you know, our nuts are, you know, they've done research on fish and, you know, it would actually show an improvement in the way that we removed our, you know, byproduct from the bowel, you know, from the actual villi again. And so again, though, you're wanting high quality, you're wanting to ensure that what you're taking has been signed up check in with your practitioner you know it's not you know, just go out and buy a hundred things it's more about you can get a lot of this in food yeah food and quality both of like so much of what's happening in america anyway i'm sure the size of your country you already know your farmers but here it's been a problem i mean that's why i like switzerland so much you know your farmers in switzerland because the entire country is the side of rhode island so when it was spending so much time in Switzerland, we go down the road to pick up our vegetables. That's the farmer that picked them earlier that day. I'm assuming it's very similar to that in New Zealand, yeah? Yeah, well, we still have grain. We, we don't have grain-fed meat here. We have grass-fed. We find we can't the use it. standard for meat is New Zealand's meat. Yeah. I had to um, laugh. One of my uh, students sent me a... Um, message earlier this morning going I love New Zealand fish and it was a picture of a bag that he'd bought in, in the US and I hear of it a lot but we, we it's that's why we can't use a lot of your research because it's a lot on grain fed and we are we're grass fed still it seems to us you know such an odd thing but you know and, and our fish you know being so far down in the bottom of the world has its advantages there's not as many toxins down here so we can still have fish here without the same level of mercury and all those things that you guys have to deal with. So we feel, you know, we're very lucky here in, in New Zealand. Um, and, you know, I'm very aware of that. That's why, you know, be careful with what you're choosing in the United States because, you know, it could be more adverse than helpful for you. And that's the point. No, be an intelligent consumer and know what you're buying. Don't just, I need a fish oil. How many times do they filter it? What, where is it, you know, exactly? What's the company's politics behind it? What's their energy behind it? There's a lot to that. And the congruency, and I think a lot of the shift that's going on right now with consumerism is going to happen, that people are going to be very clear about who they're purchasing from, who they're getting real information from, because they've been able to get 100% of the information. And it's been beautiful. There's been some yeah. good happens with this lockdown. But knowing your quality of fats and meats and then what types of fats are and what types of fats are we should increase, like walnut and avocado and coconut is a medium chain and all the nuts and seeds that were allowed. So did you have more to say about increase certain good oils? No, I sorry, did you what did you say then? I missed that bit. No, I just said we've talked a lot about the oils and selecting good ones. You know, my yeah. Avocado. I like those two oils and, and flaxseed. I like those three the best. That's one yeah. the most. Alrighty. So obviously this is kind of, you know, obvious to most of us and in the health field, you know, our raw fruit and vegetables still play a big part. Um, you know, they are supposed to be the, the, the biggest part of your meal rather than just a little bit to the side. New Zealand is really bad for meat and potatoes and vegetables as a side thought. So, you know, we're very much because farmers, those kind of people in New Zealand, a lot of, but, um, you know, it is, it is a huge part of keeping us, you know, well, we've got all the chlorophyll, all the, there's so many things like, you know, um, of, of, you know, aspects of vegetables that help. And there's a lot of good advice out there. It's, you know, it, but it's kind of the, I always go, it's not rocket science. If you're going to eat your vegetables and your fruits, you're going to help your body repair and recover. And it's the greatest way to absorb because they've been built in their entirety, right? So a piece of vegetable was built in a way for you to absorb it and assimilate it. Whereas if you extract all the time stuff from it, you're losing some very important digestive enzymes and components. So I'm like, eat your fruit and veg. And do a variety and make them in all sorts of ways and don't just blend them in a smoothie. Yeah. Biting, masticating, seed from porn. I love smoothies. I do. I absolutely do. I love soups as well. But I do make sure that I chew food every single day. That, that component because the saliva mixing with it has importance to do with my digestion. Colors of the rainbow are important. Making sure we eat all the colors of the rainbow. 
you know, going to the grocery store, I have to say, I've noticed, I don't know if it's just because I'm going to the local grocery stores here or if people are just more aware. I feel like there are way more fruits and vegetables in people's uh, carts than I've ever seen before. Now, I have noticed, and I just commented on this to Ian, that I just got back from the grocery store today and the wine aisles are cleared out. <laughs> But as much broccoli and green beans as you want was available at Kemerton today. And I was just like, <laughs> wow. But well, someone might use that at the advantage to say that there it is an antioxidant if it's red wine, right? <laughs> yeah. But but eating the different colors to it is key. And yeah. season, you know, not making like oranges are not available in December because they're not available in December. Exactly. <laughs> so good. Excellent. So another one is refined salt. As I said, there's a couple of things out there in this world that get, we get quite lost in. You know, we are saline solution. We, you know, we aren't made up of pure water. So there is it's all like those saline. different saline. Just saline. saline. Uh, saline. So saline. that's sodium chloride, saline, it's ocean water. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So the refined salt has got no substance. So we, we had it here a lot with iodine, or iodine you call it here. Um, and, you know, but what happened is salt got labeled refined salt bad. We stopped all salts and then we stopped our iodine and then we started seeing a deficiency in the iodine, which is so important for the thyroid, which is part of what produces our T cells, which are lymphocytes for the immunity, just so we can go down the track. So it's important that we still maintain some sort of salt in our body and they help with the electrolytes. So, you know, they're, they're so important for our, the way the fluid sits inside or outside the cell. And so we do want some, so we sort of, and you know, here in New Zealand, we talk about Himalayan salt, which I'm sure is, you know, what you have there in the US as well. Um, but do be mindful of finding one that maybe has kelp or iodine in it because it is an important part of component if you want to look at, for example, um, what we call apoptosis, which is shutting cell growth down. So our thyroid is kind of really important for our metabolism, our hormones and everything. So, you know, if you can add that into the equation, it is an added benefit. But we do want certain salts. But the problem is there's a lot of salty food out there and it's with refined salt and it's causing a lot of fluid issues for people. The, if you have the wrong kind of salt, it creates edema, it creates a swelling. If you have the right kind of salt, it creates electrical stimulation throughout the body because we're bioelectrical computers. And yes. our computer energy is run through water by the minerals. Yes. Our salts. Magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, the ferrum, these are minerals that if you burned me as a cadaver, I'd end up as 12 tissue cell salts. 12 tissue cell salts are what we're made up of, and we need to get those in foods and in good salts. But we also need the iodine for our thyroid, which we can get through seaweed vegetables. And you know, a lot of people are actually dehydrated, like they've got lots of fluid, like they feel like a puff ball of fluid, but they're actually dehydrated in the cell. And so those, that's why it's so important to have this electrolyte balance because you know, the, there is quite a myth that, oh, if I'm really fluidy, I shouldn't drink as much water, but it's actually not because the body goes into even more survival and holds fluid even longer. But those, the, the good salts are part of the equation to actually help your body no longer hold on to fluid. So, you know, it is an important balance. The electrolytes are kind of like the messengers inside and outside the cells telling the cells what to let go of and what to hold on to. So by balancing the electrolytes, it allows the balance of that fluid excess to be let go of, which is why that woman looked like she lost 15 pounds. A lot of it was water weight. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Salt is a huge issue. And I hope everybody's understanding. These aren't big asks. These aren't, you know. Oh to start a new routine. This is living a bioregulatory lifestyle. These are changing some attitudes, some behaviors, so that long term we're enhancing our health. We're supporting, we're supporting our ability of our own body to fight for the toxins and the exposures of pathogens that our body deals with every single day, coronavirus or not. Well, we have an, I mean, I'm sure the analogy is the KISS analogy is here in New Zealand, keep it simple, stupid. And, 
you know, this is about trying to keep it simple so you can, you know, easily apply these things into your life. And that's the difference it will make because it, it's not big changes. And but from a, a health point of view, it can be significantly huge. And one of the other one is the tight fitting clothing. You know, we see it a lot. Bras are probably the worst. They are, they say, I think about 96% of women are incorrectly fitted for bras and they do wear them really tightly. And there was some study done in Zurich um, in a hospital there and they found even the lightest bra, so the lightest touch impeded the lymphatics. So again, you know, your tight socks, all those are indicators that A, there's a fluid issue, a lymphatic issue, and B, that the clothing is acting as a, like a tourniquet or like a compression. A so, yeah, like a, like a um, cutoff. Yeah, a tourniquet like when I start IVs, right? Or when I... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so, but in saying that, there's some phenomenal compression tights and stuff out there now, if you really want to move your lymph, you know, like you've got, we call them skins, do you have them here in, in the US, do they, yeah. yeah, so there's some, you know, like a lot of the athletes are wearing compression type gear, and it's designed to actually help the fluid move, and it can be something you can also obtain if you want to wear, but we tend to um, go like a full fitting, full leg waist type scenario if you're talking about your lower extremities, so your legs. Um, and, but obviously, um, you know, you don't want to be putting really anything on the arms or anything like that unless that's medically approved because that will cause issues. But, you know, there is certain stuff that you can get now that can help if you're trying to really work that lymphatics, especially in the lower extremities. And that's great for recovery because we've talked a lot about health and illness, but we're, you're talking now about athletes and recovering and helping them, um, optimize their game and optimize their ability to recover and, and move out the lactic acid that's created when they exercise because it also fills up the lymphatics that makes an improper, uh, ability for the body to work optimally. So by removing the lactic acid that builds up when you naturally exercise, these athletes are able to move it out because Desiree doesn't work just in the wellness category. She works in the sports category and in the esthetician category with some of the other things that she does familiar with all these well we don't see a lot of athletes we've seen a fair amount throughout the years but this is something and also people that fly a lot i find mm -hmm. compression stockings because we've recommended yeah. those to some of our clients that are on a lot of planes because it just helps yeah. it's, well, it's protection from dvt so you know your your blood clots so you know there's there's a lot of reasons to do it i mean i certainly wear full leggings uh, when I fly and it does make a significant difference to when I don't. You can quite clearly see a couple of pounds gain in fluid if I don't. So, you know, it's, um, and that's not good for my health, right? So I want to keep that fluid moving. A struggle on the other side for you to recover where this just allows your body a little band-aid to get through that process easier when you know you're stressing it by you know, flying for 24 hours on sea. Ah. So then we're going to talk about lymphatic massage. So that's obviously, um, you can go to a specialized um, practitioner and I would suggest you use someone that actually has been trained in it to some degree because it is specialized, it's not deep tissue, it is more of a surface feel to it. its soft and gentle um, because those, as we learned, those vessels are just under the skin. And there's lots of technology around now too that's available to um, use. And of course, as we've said, there's going to be this handout that you can get if you go to notmeds.com where you can learn to actually look after yourself. So what you can do from a lymphatic drainage point of view, but it's just another way of moving that lymph. And sometimes it just gets a bit sluggish and it's like, you got to get it moving and sometimes we've got to, it's no different to you know when we exercise for the first time it, it really hurts for like the first week and then all of a sudden it gets easier and easier well the lymphatic system is pretty much the same it will initially take a bit to move it but then once it starts to move it's like oh yeah I remember what I do now okay let's go and off it goes so you know but it's something that you can add in like the technique we've seen that can be done every day in the shower um, or before you get out of bed in the morning or before you go to sleep at night you know, it doesn't need to be an excessively long process, you know, three to five minutes and you sort it kind of scenario. So we've, um, so just check with Kelly's website and um, it's available on there. So that's our 10, but I want to add a couple more. 
I want you to have an understanding um, of what we put on our skin is a big part of what happens to our lymphatics. Now, most product will, you'll be told it's safe and it is in its initial entirety. But I think what we haven't thought about is if we put just like say a drop of moisturizer on our face every day of every week, of every month, of every year, that's starting to build up a toxic load. And of course, it's going to go through the epidermis, it's going to go and under the skin. And you know, it's really interesting talking to some beauticians in that they often say, we well, have put eye cream when they've had surgery, there's been a byproduct sitting there still from all the cream you've applied. And you know, when they did some study, the scary thing is, and the research um, they did it in the Journal of Toxicology on breast cancer tissue. So they took 20 mastectomy um, cases so that the breast was removed and they found there was and this is in the US they found there was a million times more parabens in that tissue than there should have been and most of them ironically were around the armpit so be mindful of what you're putting on your skin because your poor lymphatic system is again the system that's having to pick it up deal with it, remove the toxins and get it out. So this is why there's such a bigger drive now to not only are what we eat, but we are what we wear as well. Like that's going to have an impact. We used to have a, oh, I still say, if you're not willing to put it here, don't put it here. Yeah, yeah that's a great analogy. You know, I, I'm not a high maintenance, like I, I'm high maintenance don't get me wrong in lots of ways, but not when it comes to skincare and all that. Like, I can't be bothered with all that. It's, and throughout the years, I've always been so happy that I can't be bothered because I always find that this information comes out and I'm like, you know, Silas still makes fun of these. He loves these right here, but I've had- Oh, I have those too. That's why I have a fringe to hide them. <laughs> my whole life, but I have to say, I'm 46 years old and I have to say, my skin is pretty good and I don't use, I don't use any- crazy creams by any stretch of the imagination, any oil, but I do move my lymph. And when we, I, I don't know if I ever showed you those pictures. We did lymph on one, um, on one of our clients, only on half of her face for like, we were going to do a facelift on her, you know, through lymph. So we the goal was to do six on just one half of her face and see what the difference was. Yeah. But one, she's like, no, you have to do my other face. I look like I've had a stroke. The side of the face is lifted and the side of the face looks, and I can tell when I need lymph on my face. I can tell down here more, but here it's very subtle for me, but I can start to notice it because I start to get wrinkles. Yeah. Trying to move out my lymph. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. not sensitive enough for us women. What is it? Right, exactly. You know, I'm 70 after all. Did you not know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's not only skincare, but then the makeup which is full of a lot of chemicals, a lot of, you know, I, I mean, I put on makeup today for the first time in a long time because we were doing this video, um, but my skin hasn't missed putting on makeup, even the natural makeup, even makeup, because I have to use something to get my mascara off at night because it flakes off otherwise it's just because it's great, you know, holistic mascara. But I noticed that not having to do that, my eyes just look better. I don't get... Mm -hmm circles in the morning, which is really just the leftover mascara from the night before. Yeah. It's really absorbing in my skin, going to my lymph and probably causing, you know, for my system. So good point. What we put on our skin. She gives you 12. What's number 12? So last but not least, um, cause there's still many more, but let's just, you know, we'll just, I just want to put in, um, repressed emotions. Um, you know, like if you're into Louise Hay, she always talks about what are you holding on to? She and ends with a mic drop. That's awesome. Oh, by the way, your repressed emotion. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if you're, if you're holding on to, you know, they've shown in research, they call it psychoimmunology, right? And they've shown in research that, you know, it was even done in Pennsylvania. What did they found that the negative moods may not only change the way in which your immune response functions, but they are associated with an increased risk of exasperated inflammation. And that was done in, in the University of Penn. So, you know, it's in your backyard. They're proving now that if we are holding on to emotion, it's going to impact on our immunity and also obviously the lymphatics. And it's like, think of it just as clearly as it's the garbage system. It's dumping everything. So why wouldn't it dump emotional? And we see it in clinic, right? When we're doing someone's lymphatics, 
it's not uncommon for them to all of a sudden open up about their whole life and they're, or they're crying or they're letting go or for 24 hours they're really you know emotional and they're going what's wrong with me and I'm going well it's no different to going to the toilet to get rid of the waste of the lymphatics whether it's urine or through the you know bowel right it's just a cellular let go and it's okay it's fine but it's it's so important that we understand that our emotions so Right now, we've got so much fear out there, so much stress out there, and that's going to be reducing your immune system. And so it's about learning to let it go. Like it's, it's there, have an awareness to it. Absolutely, why wouldn't we fear it? But to hold on to it and to make it our own is where the issue really starts to come in against our health. Well, we are not our minds. We are not our bodies, right? We are who we are we hold on to our dramas and our traumas and our angst and our worries and our fears that becomes what we identify as but it's still not us one of the things in that first hour you said that day was lymph is about letting it go yeah and one thing she just did unconsciously when i said that was what Breathe in and breathe it goes in. back to her first recommendation. You want to let it go, take a big deep breath in and breath out and let it go. And I do horse slips all the time. Can't be serious when you do that. Carrie has a horse, and often when we're talking on the phone, she's at the barn and the horse is in the background going. And we, we constantly are saying that we're going to make a little, um, we're going to have Rasmus make this on Sound of Soul so that when on the soul it gets converted to horse lips because that way you can't take anything in your life seriously and how could that not bring up your joy factor but breathing in and breathing out not only does it stimulate your lymphatic but with the expression of breathing in breathing out you're letting go well they say um she also says that it's the recentering of your life of joy and love so you know, and then Annette Noontool talks about harmony, you know, it brings back harmony again. And I think right now, this whole experience we're all going through is allowing us to really go within, define so much about ourselves. You know, I just had a practitioner ring me just before going, okay, seriously, what in the world's going on? What did I have to experience? How painful it was? She's an osteopath. Um, it is to know what my clients go through because I can barely walk right now, you know, but it's like, well, where did that come from? She didn't injure herself. She's getting a time to reflect. She can go within. She can work it out. What's the emotion attached to it? Sometimes it's just asking. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to be a big psychological process. It can just be, well, what am I holding on to? Why is the pain there? What does that reflect to me? And, and it's all about then if we let that go, the lymphatics are letting it go. And so it may come out as sadness or fear or anger, but that's okay. Anger is actually a healthy emotion. It's fantastic if it's used in the right context, not on someone. It's designed to go, you know what, I've had enough. This is not okay anymore. I'm done. And so it allows you to give you that strength to go, right, I'm letting go. I don't need to hold on and be defined by it. I've had the experience. It changed my life but it's not defining me. And I think that's the key that we kind of miss is that, but like you said, the being defined by it, it's, it's about, we still can be who we want to be. Right. And that's the essence of lymphatics is coming back to being re-centered in your heart and it will be about joy. And one of the amazing things I've observed in this last three weeks that we've been in lockdown is, is I'm right on the waterfront and I can see families out and they're walking and they're doing things with their kids. And, they, you know, I hear from them talking about playing board games again. And they're, I'm teaching my 25 year old daughter how to knit a scarf. I mean, come on, you know, like it's, it's amazing what's going on in the world right now. And it's, and interestingly, um, We've had a massive crime reduction here. You know, it's 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 phenomenal to see. And let's face it, the earth might, must be right now taking a big out breath because the you know the from a point of view of the smog and the pollution and you know there's so many really cool things that are happening out of all this. And so that's what overcomes fear for me is seeing the positive and then observing the fear, but then just letting it go that it is just a normal human response. But I don't need to buy into it. Exactly. And, let it go. and let it go and look at all the good that it's created because I agree I mean there's been so much beauty that has come out of this that I would like to suggest the whole world does this every single year 
three weeks and shuts down and turns off the electronic smog and goes in and turns in and just goes, okay, three weeks. Well, I don't know when I last had three, four weeks Either. to just be, it, it's just been phenomenal, you know, and the self-care has been just wonderful to be absorbed in right now to the point that I kind of went like a, under a rock for a while because it was just such a cool thing to do. And so, yeah, you know, again, it's how we look at it. And, um, but coming back to the lymphatics, it's all about letting go and repressed emotions is going to inhibit the lymphatics on some level. So for me, it's like, you know, can you remember the old, um, oh, what's that, that, that frozen movie? Let it go, let it go. <laughs> so make a song out of it if you need to. You know, I know you have a sister and if she watches this, I'm sorry to say this to her, but she already knows this because I said this to her. You are the sister that I always wanted that I never got to have. You just happen to live 16 hours away from me. And when I watched that movie, I cried so hard because I was like, I want a sister. And I got, and I really appreciate you, sister. And I really thank you so much for this incredible gift to not only the True Wellness client, but I really hope that this spreads virally on the internet to get people to know how they can manage their own health because not only managing their own health, but managing inside, which is a whole nother subject matter. Perhaps we can invite you back on our podcast at Not Meds and have you talk about that, how to center within and how to self-care um, for yourself when you feel the energies of the earth and the planet and all these things that are going on and, and your sense of that. So we really, truly thank you, Desiree, for this incredible gift today. Time and your energy and this incredible intellectual property that you gave out today. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And I'm wishing you all, you know, good health and safety out there. And, and let's get our lymph moving. All right. We'll leave it at that. <laughs>